All right, Ike. This week in the news, I personally huge fan of this idea. So go with me on this. You all right? All right. You take the door. You take the door of a uh, of a nineteen eighty four Land Rover Defender. Specifically, eighty four. It has to be a nineteen eighty four. Yeah. It's like a fine vintage of wine. A nineteen eighty four Land Rover Defender, and you punch a bunch of little little squares out of it. All right. And then with those little squares, you make an incredibly high precision watch that, wow. you, wear, that you wear on your wrist. What Where you can I buy one? Well, you're in luck because our good friends at Arconic, makers of the finest Land Rovers for sale videos on the internet, <laughs> I have to say, the cinematography of an Arconic Land Rover for sale video is, I mean, seriously, I don't know if they got Roger Deakins in there shooting these things, but uh, they do a great job. They definitely have one of the little steady stick, steady, ca- it's so for smooth, sure. glassy for smooth, sure. glassy smooth. They have, I believe, their entire world is covered in that uh, Lincoln mat uh, floor covering stuff. You know, the the, the click together mat uh, floor stuff. Yeah. It just it looks amazing. They do such a great job of making internet videos. Um, <laughs> so they are they are now, now, and I actually haven't seen the video for this. I've got to go look it up now that I've said that because I bet the video is amazing. They are now making watches that you wear on your wrist and tell time with Swiss, Swiss mechanism, mechanizing in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, that are are partially uh, crafted from a 1984 <laughs> Defender, uh, a a right side door, I believe, uh, if I if I if I'm correct about the literature. And what wasn't correct, they're making 300 watches. And what okay. I'm not sure is, are they all from the same door? That seems like too much material for one door to give up. I mean, the watches are quite small. You know, that's maybe I don't know. Is it a not quite an inch by an inch or something? I believe it's the part that sits behind the face. Of the, it or, is I'm the sorry, face. It is the face. It is, yes, it is it's the, the face. It's the, maybe it's the face. Yeah, it's the face. I haven't actually um, seen it, but um, yeah, you know, I can't imagine what could possibly go wrong with a precision instrument made out of a 1984 Land Rover door. <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's maybe the most rust prone era of Land Rover yeah. vehicles. They Without they like question. stopped painting the backsides of everything to save on paint. You know, mm-hmm. in about '84. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, uh, do they at least look nice? Yeah, they look kind of cool. They're they're like sort of a I uh, they're sort of like Apple Watch looking shape, like the kind of rounded corners square. <laughs> Except you can't change the screen. Nothing from is changeable rust. about it. It, yeah. it is rust. Well, it's the funny thing is, is it starts off as as clean metal, um, and then give it about I don't know what do you think two or three weeks, depending on the relative humidity of your environment, and then you have a rusty one. Well, so, you, maybe if you walk next to a sink or drink a soda, maybe the patina stuff. would change. You, you can't. can't do it that says stuff. it in the you, literature. You can't do that. No, you can't Warranty do that. is void. It's not like it's not only don't wear it in the shower. It's like don't wear it into the bathroom because it's just too much humidity in there. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. it the band is actually made of silica gel packs. <laughs> in a constant state of dehumidification That's, uh, but i mean if you're interested if you're interested it's about a thousand pounds so what about fifteen sixteen seventeen hundred dollars mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. they do look cool i mean they're they're a neat looking thing and as i've said you know um you know arconic is a maker of fantastic internet videos they really do a great job and uh yeah totally cool it is definitely it is a it is a one-of-a-kind item because i can't imagine any two of them will ever be the same because it's made out of a land rover door panel, made out of a land rover door panel. i don't think there's any two of those that were ever made the same so it's uh just a continuing the legacy um and i'm not sure if they went ahead and restored the car and just left the door off of it, or if uh, where where that donor door came from. Interested around that story, but anyways, in other news, um, I know personally uh, the one thing that I have uh, that has held me back from buying a Land Rover uh, Evoque, a Range Rover Evoque, is the fact that it's just not quite long enough. I don't know if you've ever felt that. <laughs> I feel like that's a trick question, but uh, yeah, it's definitely, you know, I've, I've seen that vehicle and I've thought to myself, this is not evocative enough, you it's know, almost evocative enough. If only it was just a little bit longer. Just well, a little bit. You are in luck. Uh, Land Rover has decided to take the long wheelbase to Vilk, which I, I actually didn't even know that that was a thing that you could have, but apparently you can have a long wheelbase to Vilk, and they're bringing it everywhere. 
in their in their uh, program a new initiative that Land Rover started, which is uh, build anything we can. Is yeah. the, is the name of the program? There's, I guess, not as many chips in the Vogue. You can make the Vogue much longer without adding any additional chips to it, which is really important right now. So they can make that car. So they're going to make it longer, and they're going to send that uh, out around the world. I'm, I, I don't mind the Vogue. I've driven an Vogue. I driven. I've only driven an Vogue in the UK. I've actually never driven one on the left hand side of the car, but on the right hand side of the car, uh, you know, it's fine. It's a nice little car. It's a fun little car to drive around. I have never had the pleasure of doing so. But uh, now that I know there's there's a longer wheelbase, yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll definitely uh, I probably won't drive one. Yeah, probably won't drive one. Never. In, in fact, I I didn't even look up how much longer it was. Honestly, cause, never uh, never learned how to drive an automatic transmission. I don't really care. Yeah, no, I I hit. So there's a learning curve. It's a steep <laughs> curve. If, it, if it's even synchronized, I struggle. So, uh, you know, so yeah, it's just one of those things. You know, that's the problem with kids these days. They don't know how to drive an automatic transmission. Um, so I, I thought, uh, as, as is one of my favorite things to do, um, I think this is fast becoming my favorite segment, uh, is uh, the uh, Land Rover faux pas, or uh, what doesn't Ike like about this Land Rover? <laughs> um, and uh, I, I think this one, this might be the ultimate in uh in gripey uh Ike disliked Land Rovers as it, it I mean it is a Land Rover in that you know like the uh, like the uh, the watch it is made out of Land Rover but I'm not exactly sure that it is exactly what Sully Hull had in mind uh for this particular vehicle and of course we are talking about the uh Bell Arnez long nose series the, Land Rover. That's true. That's true. The Bell RNs, I think I'm, I'm probably I'm pronouncing it wrong, but uh, that Land Rover has, it's definitely made the rounds. It's a distinctive, striking looking custom Land Rover vehicle. It's based on a, you know, mid sixties, one Oh nine wagon, mm-hmm. you know, I want to mm-hmm. say. Yeah. And, and for those that you have, that haven't seen it, uh, essentially what they've done is they've kind of combined the, you know, pre-war roadster aesthetic yeah. with a post-war Land Rover four-wheel drive vehicle. And so it has kind of the, you know, leather straps on the hood and the exposed exhaust pipes. And they've made the rear seat of a 109 wagon into the front seat. So you sit yeah. quite a bit further back and it has like a hood that's three miles long. And that is my favorite part of it is that you get in the back door. You get in the back the door. door. The which back I door is, is like how door. Shaquille O'Neal would drive a Series 3 anyways. They would just Probably. take the front seat out and he but, would just get in the back door. And but they've moved the pedals back. I don't you know, even know the, if they would need to. Yeah, well, they would just, in his case, true. But in the yes. actual vehicle, they've moved the entire firewall basically where the back of the front door would be. And, and what so fills in all that, all that extra space? Uh, just a big, long, extra long hood. It's like, you know, super, super long. And uh, I think the original concept was that they would put this crazy tank engine in it, a Merlin Meteor engine mm, in it. Mm, mm. But, but that was apparently scrapped when they realized that that engine weighs like 4,000 pounds and yep. would crush the vehicle. And there's like seven of them or something, <clears throat> and it's uh, some guy in a garden shed in the Midlands that uh, so, restores them. And- so instead, they put a, a Rover V8 engine in it, which is uh, quite small. It fits yeah. in the standard engine bay. Yes. So I don't know what they've put in the rest of the engine bay. That's one thing I have mm. never seen mm. is the engine bay of this vehicle. But uh, I can only imagine that it has – what What do you think they could put in there? Like oh, it four be beanbag chairs? Maybe they've got some beanbag chairs in there. They may have uh, you know, a little uh, – any number of beatnik poetry accessories. Maybe they've got some of those drums that you, you sit on and do the drumming. I don't know. Well, no, I think, honestly, um, it's probably full of, uh, of Dalmatian puppies or something. Dalmatian puppies. Uh, That's you know. a good point. You know, uh, this vehicle does look like if Cruella de Vil had a Land Rover, this would be it. It, yeah, uh, it is it, truly the Zimmer of Land Rovers. It is Zimmer. a, uh, it, it, it's just, it's not, it doesn't quite have the Zimmer like, uh, like air conditioning duct that, uh, duct work that uh, comes out from underneath the hood. But, uh, it does have, and I don't know if they're functional. It has the cutouts like a, uh, like the, uh, Hans, uh, I was going to say Hans Zimmer, uh, but, uh, like the, uh, what was it, Hans Zimmer? The, the HR Geiger, um, Batmobile. Do you remember that from the, from the, 
George Clooney Batman, where it had like Ooh, a, like a I don't think anyone wants to. Ad- I don't think anybody wants to admit to having seen that film. Yeah, we've all seen it. The, the bat suit had nipples. It you know it happened. Uh, I think Clooney was the best Bruce Wayne and the worst Batman. I think we're going way off the rails. Here. Anyways, anyways <laughs> if Batman if Batman owned a Land Rover, uh, it would very likely be one of these. Is yeah, there's like a rib cage sticking out of either side of it. Maybe it's functional exhaust. Maybe it isn't. Hard to know. say because there's not really. I haven't seen any pictures of the engine bay. Now I will say that this vehicle appears to be well constructed. Like it, it seems well built. I'll give them that. You know, like a. They've slanted the back of the car. It has a tailgate on the back, and they've slanted mm-hmm. that forward about 45 degrees to give it sort of a, a more sporty appearance. So, you know, I think, you know, my love of Land Rover stems from their utility, their usefulness. And I think my problem with this car is that everything that they have done to it has made it less useful. But From uh, the it, side, if you squint, it looks like a little bit like a Volkswagen thing. You know, like it's got it's got weird slanty panels where there shouldn't be in the way that the the Volkswagen thing kind of does, except it's like two Volkswagen things parked one right in front of the other. Or, yeah, yeah, with two hoods or something. Yeah. But, uh, you know, certainly a vehicle that, you know, I guess I admire their uh, out of the box thinking, but the, the result doesn't resonate with my personal aesthetic. That's a diplomatic way of saying I don't Dipl- like it. Speaking of a diplomatic way of saying things, uh, Ike, it's it's finally come to the time where we have decided uh, it's time to emerge from our cave of podcasting um, and uh, include some guests on the show. It's been a, a an incredibly uh, it's been requested um, by uh, you know dozens, if not uh, three. Uh, of our uh, beloved <laughs> listeners that you really should start having uh, one of those is my wife that you really should start having guests <laughs> on the show to break up the monotony of what is otherwise uh, Your too, much, <laughs> too much too much Steve um, yeah you know and uh, and so Frank uh, from Black Rhino Tours has our Black Rhino Expeditions I'm sorry has uh, graciously uh, agreed uh, and accepted our invitation, and uh, so we're going to get uh, we're going to get Frank on the show. I'm and, excited to uh, talk to Frank. He's I'm been really in the Land Rover well. world so for a let's, while. Uh, let's uh, let's let's uh, start. Make sure we pull out the choke and and start up the uh, the interview machine and uh, and see how it goes. And uh, and uh, yeah, here let's let's grab Frank. All right, we have uh, Frank Budenbrock from Black Rhino Expeditions with us, Ike. Thank you, Frank, first of all, for coming on the show. Um, Our inaugural uh, guest, which is uh, why we are uh, such experts at this. Normally, Ike and I have been at this uh, by ourselves for months now, like I think maybe the whole country has been at lots of things all by themselves Mm -hmm. for the past Mm -hmm. uh, year and a half. Uh, So we are so happy uh, to have you uh, joining us uh, today to chat about, uh, obviously, uh, Black Rhino, your uh, expedition uh, outfitting company, but also uh, mm-hmm. just your uh, general love of uh, land rovering. So, Frank, maybe we'll start there. Um, what mm-hmm. brought you to the best 4x4 by far in the first place? What attracted you to the Land Rover? Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me, uh, especially on your inaugural show. I, I feel kind of honored to, to be your guest for that. As far as Land Rovers go, it always seemed to me that they had the most um, cachet, the the most um, personality, I guess, of all the four-wheel drive vehicles. Uh, Jeeps, uh, okay, I guess. Uh, Toyotas, not so much. But for me, Land Rover were the quintessential expedition vehicle. And and I have a wanderlust that won't quit. I have to nail one foot to the floor, otherwise I'll wander off. Uh, When we go on vacation... Uh, a lot of times my wife and my son, they'll sit in the hotel room, they'll order uh, room service and watch movies all day long, but I, I, I can't do that. I, I said, I'm out of here. I'm on a walkabout. I'll be back at dinner time or dusk or whatever it might be. So uh, I'd love to travel, love to explore. I do it uh, hiking, do it mountain biking. I uh, also do it through uh, dirt bikes, motorcycles, adventure bikes, if you will. Awesome. Uh, but to me, the, the Land Rover was just the quintessential safari vehicle or expedition vehicle. And again, it just has so much character to it. Uh, I, uh, it's funny. I've even talked to uh, people who have been on my different trips when we'll sit around a campfire and chat a little bit. 
And almost to a person, everybody who has a Land Rover will tell me that when they're in their Land Rover, uh, as I am, even if we just go to the liquor store to pick up a gallon of milk, we're on safari, you know. But if you're driving a Toyota, can you're I interject? Just driving a Toyota, yes. Uh, when you said uh, driving to the liquor store to get a gallon of milk, yeah, that's the Land Rover lifestyle. Ike is buying milk at the liquor store. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, that sums it up. Uh, that sums it up right there. No, I, I agree with you, Frank. I think that's true. I think if you're, yeah. um, you know, wherever you buy your milk, um, driving around, even if it's <laughs> if it's around the city or if it's uh, circumnavigating uh, Malaysia, you definitely sure. feel, uh, you know, there's a certain presence. And and I think, uh, you know, folks, uh, you know, sort of joke about it when you pull up outside of perhaps the liquor store that, uh, you know, it does, a, you'll, you'll get that comment that, oh, it looks like you just came off the safari or it's, a, you know, National Geographic or something, or which is, which is right. part of it, right? I think that's, right. Uh, right. You, know, you know, that's it. So, Frank, over the years, I can only imagine that you've had uh, probably a Land Rover or two. So uh, <laughs> what are some uh, of your favorite yeah. models? What's your, what's your sort of all-time favorite? Maybe let's start there. And then let's maybe go yeah. back through the, uh, the Frank stable of, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the Iron Man mm-hmm. Hall of armors of uh, of Land Rovers that you have no doubt owned over the years. Sure, I think my favorite is the Defender One Ten, and uh, as a foot safari vehicle, anyway, I don't currently own one, but uh, for me, that would be the dream vehicle. Uh, there's a company. Am I allowed to mention names of other? Oh companies? yeah, I mean, whatever you want. Uh, They're okay. not listening, anyways. It's fine. There's no okay. no copyright issues here. All right, um, I've seen a few of the Arconic. Land Rovers. I don't know if you've seen those, but they take the. Funny you mention that we okay. had a uh, we have an iconic news item today. You know they're making watches out of uh, 1983 uh, Defender okay. doors. No kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that would be awesome to have. When yeah, right. Story. That would be fun. Sure. True story. Yeah, listen. We sure. will. The people have uh, have just heard about uh, what a what a fantastic uh, material it is to make a watch out of. Right, but their vehicles are are far and away some of the best i've ever ever seen uh i mean they're and they're pricey though they're right yeah, they, buck and a half to two grand two hundred thousand dollars i mean it's not cheap but they're just they do a really nice job they do a nice yeah. job they have a yeah. very nice floaty camera spin around of all of their cars which i i enjoy right right at, at one point on their website i was reading that uh due to the quality of the vehicles that they produce they can only make 90 a month or something like that. I was like, that <laughs> seems like a lot. a lot. That seems like a lot. That's a yeah. big number. Yeah. Seems yeah. like a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would think 90 a year would be. Even, even then, that, that would be, be a lot. Number. Yeah. yeah it, it was. Right. A, it, I'm, I'm not going to uh, say that that's the exact number, but it was a surprisingly large right. number. I was like, wow, that's um, yeah, that's, a, that's lot. a lot of vehicles right. to make. Top Look, top yeah. notch. They do a good job. Right. They do some nice. Uh, they do some nice cars. That's uh, at our kind of like right. That, so, yeah. One, I thought you were going to say uh, talking about their vehicles. They do such a nice job. They, one of the things they really concentrate on on their vehicles is the seals. And I noticed mm-hmm. in one of your previous podcasts, you turned about talked about the seals and how the doors don't or overlap the body and <clears throat> just don't fit properly. But uh, some of the wettest website. places on earth are found inside of a uh, Land Rover <laughs> Defender. Uh, I, I is, know that. Uh, I, I, we'll it's get an to that average in a rainfall that would uh, that would rival the Amazon uh, <laughs> sometimes, depending if you live in the Pacific Northwest uh, or not. Right. But yeah, no, indeed. I mean, I think that you know that's funny because you know there's these uh, groups like Icon and stuff that uh, that do a lot to sort of improve on what was you know mm-hmm. even in 2016 maybe not the uh, I, I have a, a photo of the uh, of the weather testing bay that they have at mm. Sully Hall uh, and the last couple of defenders going through there to make mm-hmm. sure that they leak properly. Uh, they <laughs> test them from the factory to make sure that the car wash gets right. inside as much as it does. Outside. But, then, you Got know, it. it's a simple one pass step to clean out both the inside and the outside and of the, the car outside. all in one Very all in true. one step. So, Frank, Very what true. other Land Rovers, uh, what, well, what Land Rover do you have currently and what have you had in the past? Uh, I currently drive a 2001 P38 and I, it's it's my third one of those. Mm-hmm. The one previous to this, uh, where I live here in Southern California, uh, I'm up in the mountains. Mm-hmm. We have a big problem with rats, and uh, the rats oh. apparently had chewed the ignition coil wiring on my engine and caused a fire. 
Wow. And uh, rats burn your car down. Essentially. Yeah. And while I was on the freeway, all of a sudden there's smoke coming out from underneath the hood. Um, I pulled over and I was really surprised how many other guys pulled over behind me to help put out the fire, which was really, really nice. So we were spraying or dumping water on the uh, engine bay and we had pretty much gotten it all out. But what had happened is the uh, insulation, the soundproofing in the hood Mm -hmm. caught fire and uh, we were tearing that out threw that in a pile behind us and now we had a small bonfire going behind us on the freeway (laughs) somehow somebody somehow had called the fire department and then they came and uh, unfortunately in their zeal to put out the fire they sprayed the windshield that had gotten super hot with Uh, ice cold water so you can imagine what happened and that uh, by destroying that windshield, it uh, it basically put me over the, the cap for recovery right. of that vehicle as far as the insurance company was wow. concerned. But all in all, it, it worked out better because I found mm-hmm. the 2001 that I have now. The, the one that burnt up was in 1997. I just love that body style. It's yep. my favorite. Uh, yeah, we've discussed like said, that body today. style on the car. Yeah, or oh, on yeah, the show. The P- yeah. And P38 owners, like we've said before, Ike, it's a dyed-in-the-wool uh, love for that car. If you love mm-hmm. a P38, you really love the the P38. And, uh, yeah, it's true. It's funny, Frank. I said, I don't think you're in the minority there with uh, people that own a mm-hmm. P38. They're they're crazy about them. I know a few folks, uh, obviously, in the club down here and, and at mm-hmm. large that are, that are huge fans, big, big advocates. Right. A good friend that moved to uh, Louisiana not that long ago had done a you know just a, a, a massive amount of work to his P38 and absolutely loved it and people love it mm-hmm. you take it to shows and stuff and mm-hmm. um you know mm-hmm. people come over and uh, and and love to look at those cars so very cool very cool and right. what have you had right. previously to the p38s what have you had in the past uh before i had that i had a 1987 range rover classic uh and i bought it stock uh it was bright yellow when mm, it was cool great great yeah. caught every eye out there and then i did all the typical things for off-roading, right? I put huge tires on it and steel bumpers, uh, not sidesteps, uh, rock uh, rock sliders. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, did all that, you know, front and rear diff guards. The front diff guard, of course, was put on after I dented the diff. <laughs> that's right? that's when like you do most it. Most of them are. <laughs> and then you never exactly. hit another thing with it. <laughs> exactly, right? And it was funny when we hit it, uh, the one of the first trips I did, I went with a friend of mine up uh, through Death Valley with Cal mm-hmm. Four Wheel mm-hmm. uh, with their November trips that they do in, in November. And we were on a, uh, a trail behind a bunch of Jeeps and Toyotas and uh, Fords maybe. And, and I, it was amazing to me that nobody else got stopped by this rock. But I swear this rock just leapt up out of the ground right in front of the diff and stopped us cold. I mean, we weren't going that fast, thank God. But, I mean, we we literally almost, you know, hit the windshield. I mean, it was incredible. I was like, I didn't see that rock. And I looked to my buddy. He goes, I didn't see that rock. Oh, so, no, that's not good I don't for know the if pumpkin. the truck ahead of us. Yeah, maybe the truck ahead of us turned it over or something. Mm-hmm. But Likely. Um, anyway, Likely. so. Yeah, that diff guard. It's never a good day when you crack a pumpkin. That's a uh, that no. is a bad uh, that's a bad day. Uh, that's a bad day for uh, for right. everyone. Uh, that was in sure. the uh, classic Range Rover. That was in the classic. Yeah. And yeah. so, and my had very you, first. Go ahead. Sorry, had you? Uh, when did you first get excited about a Land Rover? Like, what was the first thing that you saw? Was it a movie or a book or a you know poster? Or what was it that you were like, oh, Land Rovers? That's what I want. I think it was the TV show Doctare, if you remember that. They were driving a little Series 1, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then there's also that show, uh, that movie, I can't remember it now, where the the Coke bottle comes and hits the native on the The head. The gods must be crazy, yeah. The gods must be crazy, crazy. right? Remember, and they have the, the Land Rover in that, and they pull it up into a tree. If you remember those kinds of yeah. things. It's a wonderful film. Yeah. So that's yeah. a series one for sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was uh, just fun. And, and any of the books that I would read, uh, a big, huge National Geographic fan, mm-hmm. any of the uh, magazines or books I would see, you know, again, the Land Rover was the quintessential safari vehicle. And it, and it just has the, the class, I guess. And I always really enjoyed that. My first Not Land Rover all the was class. The, not all <laughs> no the right kind my, of my one. very first yeah, yeah. Uh, my very first land rover was a uh, series 2 
It was a 1964 mm-hmm. Series 2. Uh, it was British Drive, mm-hmm. and it was a diesel. And the way I had gotten it, no kidding, I had gone to the liquor store. It happened to be 7 Eleven, actually. <laughs> right. but I had gone I'm to sensing the a store. theme here. A lot of your <laughs> yeah, stories right? start at the liquor store, Frank. So, okay, all right, no, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm behind you 100%. 100%. <laughs> So I went to the liquor store, the 7-Eleven, to get a gallon of milk, right? And when I came out, there was this Series 2, right, Land Rover. And I'm going, oh, my God. I'm thinking to myself, I would give anything to have that vehicle, right? It was just perfect. And also, it was uh, had had a camouflage paint job, uh, like kind of desert storm, all mm-hmm. the... Uh, muted grays and browns and things not green but the grays grays and browns and while i'm standing there this guy walks out behind me and i'm looking at the car and he goes you like it i go oh i would give anything to have that he goes it's for sale (laughs) so i go okay so i went home talked to my wife and we talked it over she goes yeah if you really want it and you know if it there's nothing wrong with it seriously wrong with it that would be great oh there is (laughs) <laughs> it's like the guy with the genie lamp like uh, if you're willing to give me the genie lamp is there maybe right. something wrong yeah right yeah, ne- yeah never is there some guy at the liquor store who's selling a land rover that there's nothing wrong with that's right. never happened uh, <laughs> but the the guy i was buying it from happened to be a national geographic cinematographer oh, oh, cool. and uh he and a buddy of his had actually taken it out to a wash around Los Angeles, and that's how they painted it. They put it in the wash, mm-hmm. and they started putting the different tones, dark brown, black, light sand color, to see if they could get it to blend into the background. And that's how it, they painted it that way. Oh. But it was beautiful. It was a, you know, the, the long, it was a 110 or 109, I guess, at mm-hmm. the time. Mm-hmm. And it had a roof rack that went all the way from the back door out over the hood. Mm-hmm. I mean, it mm-hmm. was huge. In fact, when we moved out of our apartment, to a house, we actually use that to move almost all our furniture. We could get the couch on the top. We could get dressers on the top. I mean, it was. It was I think awesome. those uh, roof racks are referred to as the uh, rooftop patio. I think that is mm. the. Uh, that's the. Uh, could certainly very well you, be. Uh, yeah, you've, right. There was actually. I can. I were talking about it uh, not that long ago. There's a company. I don't know where they are. There's somewhere. I believe it's an African-based safari company that has what looks like a small condominium complex that folds out of a 110, and there's an upstairs wow. and a downstairs, and there's a bathroom, and I believe there's mm. a wine cellar. There's a you know waiting room. <laughs> there's a, a library, a small salon. I think they have a. Uh-huh. And noble in there somewhere. I mean, it's just insane. Okay. And then it all packs down into a 110 and, and somehow wow. drives, but it looks like a small, like I've had apartments smaller than the <laughs> insides of that 110 wow. camping complex. It's amazing. Perfect. Right. Perfect until a gust of wind comes along and your Land Rover <laughs> yeah. sails well, away. Destroys it. Oh, right. It's gone. Right. <laughs> so well, I, I went back home. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I went back mm-hmm. home, talked to the wife. She says, yeah, if you really want it, just get it checked out. So I said, great. So, uh, the National Geographic cinematographer's name was Biff, mm. uh, and his wife's name, if I remember correctly, was uh, Muffy. I'm not kidding. <laughs> He's like, you couldn't make this up. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Uh, it doesn't seem yeah. like any red flags yet. I mean, no, the right? Biff and Miffy are selling a Land Rover outside the liquor store. This all seems <laughs> totally legit. No problem. Right. So I, I organized uh, the opportunity to go pick up the truck and take it to a mechanic, right? So I went and picked it up, and this is... Oh, God, this is years and years ago, uh, 30 years ago, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was before cell phones, and, mm-hmm. and, and that's relevant because I picked up the vehicle, and then I'm on my way to the mechanic, and I thought, oh, I better call and make sure that he, uh, he knows that I'm coming, right? Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> so at that time, I pulled over to the side of the road, and I was going to use a pay phone, mm-hmm. no cell phones at that, mm-hmm. that time. And... When I went to the to uh, turn off the engine, I turned the key off. Of course, it was a diesel. Mm-hmm. It just kept running. Yeah, and I'm going, oh, oh my god, what what do I do? And I look all over the dash. There's no kill switch. There's there's nothing, right? And I'm going, oh my god, I, the car's still running, right? So I I park real as close as I can to the payphone so I can keep an eye on the car while it's running. And I run to the payphone. I call Biff and I say, mm-hmm. Biff, I, I can't turn your car off, you know. And he goes, oh, well, if you look in the middle of the dash, there's a, 
a knob there. And the original knob that basically I said, I guess it has some kind of indication that it would kill or choke the engine. Mm -hmm. He had replaced that because it had broken off and it was a fan knob. Well, who would ever pull a fan knob to turn off the engine? So that's why I never did it. But of course, I went back in, pulled the fan knob, and of course, it choked the engine or Mm -hmm. stalled the engine. So Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, bought the car and just had a blast with it. It was fantastic. I turned heads everywhere I went, every gas station I went to, every liquor store I went Mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. Anytime I stopped, people would, uh, would just get a kick out of it. And, and I, I am, think any time you started it, either late at night or early in the morning, I imagine <laughs> everyone knew that you were starting that right. car. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're speaking pretty wistfully about this 109. Are you sure I'll, you're really a P38 guy? Maybe you're a 109 uh, guy. I would kill to have this car back. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, it had it had its problems, but it, not not mechanical. Interestingly, mm. uh, the the biggest problem I had was the body had started to rust or not the body the chassis was starting to rust Mm -hmm. so i had to re-weld you know shock shock mounts and body mounts motor mounts and uh, it just got to be too much of a problem because it was it ended up being my uh, my only car Mm -hmm. my daily driver right Mm -hmm. and at the time uh, and i still am a professional photographer by trade i've been doing it for over 30 years and i was in hollywood with the vehicle at PRS. I don't know if you guys mm-hmm. know PRS, mm-hmm. camera rental place. Yep. And a photographer walks out and he sees me just as I'm getting into the car and he says, Oh, I'd love to rent that car. And I go, <laughs> That's fine. But you can you rent do, it for the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I told him, I said, If you want to rent it, you have to rent me with it because mm-hmm. it's right hand drive, yeah. right? It's diesel and it's just hard to drive. And I don't want somebody ruining that yeah, car. Yeah, destroy it. Right, yeah, yeah. destroy it, right? Yeah. And he said, no problem. So uh, the photographer was Aaron Rappaport. I don't mm. know if you know Aaron. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, this was a huge advertising campaign for a company called The Limited. Mm-hmm. And they were doing a line of clothing called Outback Red. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to, we were supposed to simulate shooting in uh, Australia. Mm-hmm. But what we did, we went to uh, New Mexico and Arizona mm-hmm. and shot there and all the red rock there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, sure enough, he hired me and the, the truck. We trailered it out there because I wasn't going to drive it all the way there. No. You know, at 50 miles an hour, yeah. I'd still be driving. <laughs> so we finally got there. Uh, we were there for about a week and, and it was great. What was fun was, I don't remember her name, but the, the supermodel that was wearing all the clothing, Mm -hmm. she wanted to be taken from location to location in this vehicle. So I got a chance to drive this young lady, this beautiful young lady around uh, Arizona and New Mexico. It was just fantastic. Frank, nobody's going to make, nobody's going to make you this offer in a P38. I'm just telling you. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good point. It's a different kind of person. It's a different kind of person that's looking for that ride in the P38. No, I think that's amazing. And, and, you know, I think it does. It speaks to the sort of uh, series ownership. It is a, it is a labor uh, for sure, but it is Mm -hmm. a labor of love. It is an amazing thing. So, uh, Frank, before we run out of time, I think it's important that we talk first of all, uh, or finally about the uh, Black Rhino Expedition uh, Company. So as I understand mm-hmm. it, uh, it is not actually to hunt black rhinos, uh, which no. is uh, that uh, no. that is a uh, mistake on my part. I, I apologize. Uh, just to hunt regular colored rhinos. Uh, yeah, exactly. No rhino hunting at all. No rhino hunting. No, no none at all. In <laughs> fact, uh, we're uh, in association with Save the Rhino. They're an organization out of the UK, and they fund different... Uh, I'm not sure what you uh, initiatives, I mm-hmm. guess, to save the rhinos <laughs> that, oh, that are in Africa. Wonderful, and so we do uh, donate a portion of our proceeds to them. Oh, that's uh, they're amazing! They're a great organization. Yeah, their website is save the rhino dot org. Mm-hmm. If uh, if anybody's interested in checking it out, and definitely would like to contribute. I would love to see that because it's a shame what they're doing over there. Uh, that you without, know, now uh, I don't know if you you're question. familiar with it, but. You know, now they actually cut the game wardens. They cut off the horns of the rhinos so that the poachers don't have a reason to kill them because there's no horn. Because they just killed a whole rhino just for the horn, right? It's supposed to give uh, 
Asian men uh, sexual prowess. Apparently, it is, uh, it is an interesting. So, uh, it is an interesting predicament. Yeah, and and, and, yeah. and terrible. Uh, you know, all the same. But that aside, um, let's talk about your uh, Black Rhino expedition. Sure, company. It has nothing to do with actual Black Rhinos. Uh, no. rather uh, a lot to do with expeditions. Correct. Yeah, we've uh, we've been doing this now. I guess for over sixteen years. I started oh, no. out actually. Uh, as president of the Southern California Land Rover Club. I was mm -hmm. there for a couple of years till I got termed out. And afterward, uh, I thought I would start my own company leading expeditions to all the same places, basically. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of them now through Death Valley. That still seems to be our at least great here in place Southern to California. visit. Yeah, mm -hmm. oh, wonderful place fantastic. to visit. And, and still, every week, I'm not kidding, I am finding new places to go. You I could mean, explore there. there your whole life and never see it all. Right. It, it's fantastic. And and so now I'm finding a, a few more mines that are uh, you're allowed to get into, I guess, mm. that look, I would say, relatively safe. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's very interesting to me. And so I, I scour you the internet down in all the, the mines. Time. Mm hmm. Oh, right on. You like yep. rappel down the shafts and all that sort of thing. Uh, I haven't done gone that far with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. a little too sketchy, at least for me, and okay. especially if I have people coming along. Yeah, unless they sign off a waiver and say I'm I'm okay with it, it would be quite the now, waiver. I, I have a yeah, I have a core group of people that would probably do it no problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're they come on almost every one of my trips, and there's they, some they great can't get enough of it. Great yeah. minds out there. Some of them that you go and. You can tell people haven't been there for decades. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wonderful. There's places. also a few great mimes in Death Valley. Um, <laughs> there you have are, to watch out for them. There, there are, are no great mimes at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Frank, talk I, about uh, the structure of one of these trips. So, if we're going to go on mm -hmm. a uh, a Black Rhino expedition, what is the uh, what, what do we have to look forward to? Well, it depends on which one we do. Let's take the uh, Death Valley one for example. Uh, I've stretched it from a three-day trip now into four days uh, just because there's so much to see. And I, I am guilty of packing in the days. It, it's a running joke, especially when we do the fall trips because the days are so short. The sun goes down about 4.30, 5 o'clock. Um, it's a running joke that, you know, we won't get to camp before sundown. Mm -hmm. And if we're staying in a hotel, that's not terrible. Mm -hmm. But if you've got to send up a tent and cook dinner – it's kind of a pain to have to do that in the dark. Mm -hmm. So most of these trips now are uh, staying at hotels. Mm -hmm. And we do offer and provide uh, meals th throughout the whole trip. So people don't have to bring stoves and, uh, you know, food unless they want mm -hmm. snacks or uh, bottled water or something like that. But we provide all the meals while we're on a trip. And then one thing I think we do that nobody else does, I have a friend of mine. He's a retired geologist and he worked for the department of the interior he was a senior geologist while he was there his name's alan shiregi mm -hmm. and he comes along on the trips and he educates us about the geology of uh, specifically death valley and it completely changes your perspective on things to see very cool you know three billion year old rock and you know uh, most of the people who come on these trips are just immensely curious, and they ask him all the time, well, what kind of rock is that? Well, that's volcanic, you know, it's basalt over there, and this is dolomite over here, and here's sandstone, and you can see where the basalt came up between two mounds of sandstone and created this um, uh, cinder cone. And it, it's just, again, it just gives you a completely new perspective and uh, outlook on what you're seeing. In yeah, fact, Death Valley, yeah, yeah, Death Valley actually is, is the mecca uh, around the world for universities to send their college students going for their master's. Oh, uh, they come there and they, in, in they'll spend a week and, yeah. you know, investigate. And analyze all the geology that's in Death well, and, Valley. And, it's uh, it's of fantastic. Course, famously, in the uh, in the nineteen sixties was where a lot of the Apollo astronauts did their survival training. There's great mm -hmm. locations mm -hmm. out there uh, for uh, that, and and a, and a good place for survival in general, as it is a pretty <laughs> wild area. I bought a right. Land Rover from a guy who um, would go with his buddy to Death Valley. 
and collect mm-hmm. rocks, you know, in this Land Rover. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would drink a lot of beer and collect rocks. And uh, when they got drunk enough, they would uh, try to hit each other with a Land Rover. One of them would take off on foot, you know, across the desert, you know, jumping <laughs> over uh, rocks and ditches and all this sort of thing. And the other one would try to run him over. They said it was super fun. Bought that Land Rover, coincidentally, from that guy outside of a liquor store in Death Valley, um, as, uh, as yeah. you can imagine. So, Frank, where limp, can people so. find out more about the uh, expeditions that you do? And uh, what are some of the things you've got coming up sort of in the future? I know you've got you're, – you're expanding into some, some new types of adventure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Our, our website is blackrhinoexpeditions.com. So they can certainly go there, and we've got a nice list of tours that are coming up. Uh, it's a good-looking very... website. I have to say the, the photos of, uh, of past trips and stuff, it looks very cool. looks like Thank a you. ton, uh, just a ton of fun and a good group. Lots of folks that, that I know, of course, from the, the Southern California Land Rover uh, Club. There's lots of familiar faces in there. And, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. it genuinely looks like uh, everybody is having a, a, a grand time for sure. Right. And it, what's nice is we, they're not limited to Land Rovers. I mean, I started that way, and that was the core group initially. But now we have everything from Mercedes Sprinters to, you know, H1 Hummers mm-hmm. to uh, Toyota Tacomas. We had one gentleman out there with a Ford Raptor. Mm. So it's really, uh, it's not Mark specific. Right. You know, I really don't care what you bring. I had organized a trip years ago. Uh, to go out to Death Valley. And on that Monday before the Friday that we left, I had six trucks going. And I thought, oh, this will be a fun trip. Nice small group. We'll get a chance to see a lot of stuff. And come that Friday morning, everybody else bailed. Everybody had something come up, sickness, uh, mechanical issues Mm -hmm. with their trucks. And and it kind of annoyed me that uh, this was through the club and we were only allowed to have Land Rovers on the trip. Uh, yes. And I had turned down a number of people who were with Toyotas or Jeeps or uh, other trucks and I couldn't have them come on the trip because it was not, it was just a Land Rover trip. And that kind of bugged me. I said, you know what, from now on, if you've got a four wheel drive vehicle and you're capable, you are welcome to come on one of these trips. Cause I couldn't, I could not go on that trip. I I had invited two clients to go Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they had, you know, rearranged their lives, had, you know, arranged babysitters, dog sitters, Mm -hmm. uh, just rearranged everything. So we couldn't not go. And I still was kind of hesitant to go a little bit because I'm really not a big fan of going alone. Mm -hmm. Right. That's like cardinal sin. Number one (laughs) is to go alone. Yeah. Right. Fortunately, the areas I had chosen to go were fairly trafficked routes. So if we did have an issue, somebody would, you know, eventually would find us and it wouldn't be a problem. But I, I'm not a big fan of that. You know, I, I try to be real safe. I have to knock on wood. I've never, never even had to uh, apply a bandage, uh, a Band-Aid on any of our trips. So, you know, of all the trips we've done, nobody's ever been injured. Uh, we have had had mechanical issues, um, but nothing that anybody ever listened to me to do ever had a problem so we've had some people that wouldn't listen to me thought they knew better and and caused problems you know what's interesting and that guy is uh, still at dr- the bottom of that mine shaft so yes <laughs> yeah. if you've uh when uh, i do a little bit of four by four training as well and we're mm-hmm. going to be do, do, doing that officially here probably at the end of august and we'll offer that as in addition to the different expeditions that we're doing because people think they know how to drive off road but not really. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first instructor was Bill Burke. Mm-hmm. When I bought my 87 Classic, I decided I wanted somebody to train me who knew what they were doing. <clears throat> I loved his um, his uh, Camel Trophy experience. Absolutely. And I figured if anybody would know, it would be Bill. Uh, and I loved his whole philosophy on, on driving. And so I took the class from him because I figured if I learn first the right way to do it, I have no bad habits to unlearn. Mm-hmm. And uh, I won't destroy the vehicle, hopefully, because mm-hmm. uh, we got to drive it to work on Monday. That's you know? right. So, did he teach you any uh, harmonica as uh, uh, along no. with recovery? No, no, no okay. not on that. Not on He's that. The trip. ultimate beatneck poet, off-road driver, <laughs> as, right? Uh, right. As Bill's good friend, and uh, and yeah. absolutely, there is no better when it comes to the the full experience of recovery and. Uh, 
you know, a deeply soulful conversation. He is right. Uh, he's a right. very uh, unique individual and a real, right. a real treasure. So, um, yeah. well, let me tell you a couple more yeah. trips. Well, we got yeah. uh, the next one coming up is to the Rocky Mountains. That's in September, September oh, wow. 12th through the 16th. That should be a lot of fun. We're going to cross the Great Divide. We'll be up there on Bear Pass, of course. That'll be mm -hmm. the last day. And everything will kind of build up to that because that's supposed to be the, they say, the most uh, scary one, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think there's uh, a C.W. Sure. McCall song about that. Is there? Yeah. Uh, another one we're going to do is uh, Moab. And mm -hmm. we're going to do two days of uh, four-wheeling and two days of mountain biking. Oh, and on that trip, we're going to use Dan Mick uh, or one of his crew to guide us around Moab. Fantastic. We've done that in the past. Just had a phenomenal time. And the mountain biking is, is to die for. It, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I think in that I whole area. I was just area, there. Wonderful. Yeah. 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 Any Nearly direction ran over turn, by a side-by-side -side, uh, ATV. Oh, nice. True. Nice. There's a lot of them. You have to beat them off with a stick out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. They're everywhere. Yep. And then we'll do another one uh, to Death Valley in uh, mid-November. We usually do one there shortly before thanksgiving because after thanksgiving into christmas and in through new year's everybody's in holiday mode yeah nobody really wants to go out uh expeditioning at all I so do. we don't start oh okay uh, <laughs> that's we'll when we go to death up. valley is christmas oh okay yeah nice. we usually go two weeks like uh, christmas and new year's fantastic yep that would be a lot of fun it's super fun it's a uh, high season for them there i know they get a lot of people to come not where we go no no, okay. the bottom of a mine Where, where do you like to go? Oh, you know, um, I like Saline Valley a lot, but uh, mm -hmm. all of those mountain ranges are wonderful. The Panamints, the Whites, uh, you know, in recent years, uh, you know, you've been able to explore a lot of the canyons. Um, we do a lot of hiking when we mm -hmm. go there as well. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, I like, I used to like Jail Canyon, but recently there was a marijuana grow. Uh, mm -hmm. discovered in jail canyon and uh yep. yeah people had uh, uh you know kind of taken over jail canyon because it was a little uh, more obscure mm -hmm. but uh there's there's just so many wonderful places just pick a place on the map and go there you know you drive until right. you can't drive anymore and then you get out and hike right it's right. a little apropos that Jail Canyon is full of an illegal marijuana <laughs> grow up. That seems just a bit, yeah. I guess, hiding, hiding in plain sight. You know, that's uh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, that spring there at the end it would be phenomenal. It'd be perfect for, for marijuana grow. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, apparently, fantastic. someone thought so too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you done the hike to Telescope Peak? Uh, I have. Yeah. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of ghost towns uh, in Death Valley. There's like a Panamint Springs, maybe. Mm -hmm. or uh, And then there's there's another one that's really up high outside of Saline Valley. I can't remember the name of that one. Um, mm -hmm. Beverage. Beverage mm -hmm. is the, the ghost town. Well, and that one's hike. that one's really serious that's mm -hmm. a not messing around hike and that's mm -hmm. one i would like to do i would like to check mm -hmm. out beverage it's pretty right. untouched because it's so hard to get to right they say it's almost better to come from the top down well to you kind of have to hike up and then back down again so mm -hmm. uh there's really not a good way to get there i think there's still a, a caterpillar you know dozer there that uh they had helicoptered in at one stage and there's okay. no way to get it out but wow. uh, there's all kinds of crazy stuff up there a couple of friends have gone there and they're like oh you gotta go so right. one of these days right. i gotta suck it up and go do it yeah are you a fan of sarah gordo we, we had a chance to stay there a number of times while uh, mike patterson the, the previous owner, mm -hmm. while he was still alive, we stayed there, stayed in the bunkhouse. He was phenomenal. Uh, he was a California history professor mm. prior to him owning this town. So he had stories about California that were phenomenal. Just yeah, fantastic. Cerro Gordo is really cool. There's a, a, a crazy mine elevator that goes down into the mines uh, mm -hmm. there. There's a lot of cool buildings, but some of them burnt down recently, I believe. And He's rebuilding it. Brent yeah. is rebuilding that. That the was American really Hotel. unfortunate mm -hmm. to hear mm -hmm. because they had that incredible bar in mm -hmm. there. And yep. uh, that was just a devastating loss in terms of uh, that area and uh, the history that goes along with it. But, right. um, you know, usually we like to hike up to these crazy mines that are just like hard to get to, rarely visited. You know, mm -hmm. we like that mm -hmm. stuff. Nobody's been there in a while. Um, you find all kinds of neat stuff, just mule right. shoes, you know, just like all kinds of 
weird little 50 caliber bullets from, you know, uh, training exercises from aircraft. You know, mm-hmm. Death Valley is one of these places where there's so many canyons, you know, and every one of them has a story. Every one of yep. them has a ghost story, a murder mystery, a crazy old person that lived there, a hermit, uh, aliens, you know, the Indian relics, you know, the Spanish were there, you know, every one. And mm-hmm. so it's just an incredible area to explore and the diversity of natural phenomenon and, you know, human history. It's really a special right. place. Right. It's funny you say that because the I, I tried to give each of my expeditions a name, a theme, if mm. you will. And the Death Valley one is called Dreamers, Miners, and Thieves. Mm-hmm. And ah. so we we explore areas that are apropos to each of those terms, right? Where dreamers were, <clears throat> where <clears throat> excuse me, where miners were, and where thieves were, or or have been, and. Uh, it, it's just uh, like you said. There's just tons and tons of history, and I've got a great Death Valley trivia book that just has all those kind of little tidbits that cool. that just make it so much fun. Well, but, Frank, uh, it, yeah. it sounds absolutely fantastic. I hope that uh, maybe we get an opportunity to experience it sometime in the future, and certainly uh, encourage everyone to go to the website and check it out and uh, mm-hmm. and sign up for an uh, upcoming trip, Frank. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, uh, again me. on this our inaugural guest interview, uh, which uh, nobody died, so I feel like this is a win. Success. Uh, we didn't leave anybody <laughs> at the bottom of the proverbial podcasting mine shaft, so uh, right. we're going to call right. it a win. So again, Frank, thank you uh, so much. All the best of luck with the uh, trips coming up, and uh, hey, please feel free to come on anytime and uh, and talk about uh, any new stuff you've got coming up or uh, any Land Rovers you've purchased outside of a liquor store lately. <laughs> well, thanks dude. Frank thanks again nice meeting you all right well no one died uh we did manage an interview and uh save maybe uh you know i don't know some people potentially falling down a mine shaft i think we uh we got through it and uh what an interesting uh individual frank is uh is always a great guy to chat with and uh, has uh no uh, end to stories. In fact, we we actually recorded a lot more with Frank uh, that didn't make it into uh, this concise, uh, form tight fitting podcast uh, that that we uh, that we bring out every week. Um, but you can uh, both find the video. And the full-length version, which is actually the same thing, the full-length video version uh, on our Patreon, if you are so inclined and want to find out uh, more interesting, hear more interesting stories from Frank. And we'll definitely have Frank on again. He is, uh, he's uh, full, of, uh, full of laughs and great tips on how to uh, buy a Land Rover outside of a liquor store. <laughs> Yeah. So finally, Ike, it's everybody's favorite segment without question, the world over uh, from, uh, you know, the East Coast uh, to the West Coast and the one or two people that we have in between. Uh, it is favorite. Uh, I, I always say favorite, but what I mean is it's famous Land Rover owner of the week. This week may be, may be one of the most famous. Yeah, definitely. Winston Churchill, definitely a titan uh, in history, you know, and a famous Land Rover owner. Uh, He is a statesman, a painter, a lot of uh, amazing quotes from Winston Churchill, none of which I can remember right now. But he um, has a dog designed after him. I mean, that's there's not many people that uh, they get that uh, that get that treatment. That uh, it's a it's a clever uh, individual's bred Winston Churchill with some type of uh, with some type of dog to develop the bulldog. I believe he's part Winston Churchill. Uh, I don't think any of that is accurate, <laughs> but it is. There's any way to prove it or disprove it. So at this point, just agree to disagree. But, uh, of course, a, a super, super Land Rover owner, so much so that a lot of Winston Churchill's post-war uh, effort uh, led to the creation of the Land Rover in the first place. And of course, he was the owner uh, of a, uh, a very, a very uh, famous a UKE80. Do they pronounce UKE as a word? Is it uck? Is it uke? Is it I, what do they what do they call? I'm the, sh- we love I'm sh- to give that three letter designation a name for some reason, but uh, I don't think it needs one. I think you just say UK eighty UK eighty eighty. Yeah, I. Uh, but this car is uh, one that has been known for a long time. It was uh, kind of, I would say, not necessarily lost, but it was. Um, 
it was not well preserved or at least well cared for for some period of time, but very remained very original. It was like a working vehicle. They put a truck cab on it, mm-hmm. and it still had its original paint, and it was still in in, in remarkable condition uh, when it was sort of I, I want to say unveiled, but but offered for sale about what 15 years ago something like yeah, that Yeah, that sounds about right and is it true that they gave it to him on his 80th birthday did he live to be 80 years old i think he lived to be older than 80 like 84 maybe That's or 86 amazing. that is amazing meaning that the photo of him next to that car he's 80 years old and he doesn't look a day over like 75 he, he, apparently he was he was several days older than that yeah. in the photo but uh the land rover has a couple of special features it has a uh, an extra girthy seat yes, to course. to accommodate him or extra comfy seat and maybe an armrest on the door mm-hmm. and uh, I think a special heater. You know, most of the pictures you see him with the vehicle, um, it's it's got no roof. Yeah. And so he's, he's got a coat on, he's got a hat, yeah. and uh, he could get in and out of the vehicle easily. And uh, I, I'm not sure where the vehicle was used and in what capacity and how much he used it. But uh, Winston Churchill was born and died at Blenheim Palace, which is incidentally where my 107 wagon was used during the same or similar period. Um, really? I have was been indeed- to Blenheim Palace. I did not realize that your 107 wagon was from uh, Blenheim Palace. I would have let them know. John Spencer Churchill, I yeah. believe, uh, was the uh, uh, first owner. The Duke of Marlborough was the first owner of my, my Land Rover. And now the current Marlborough man. <laughs> but uh, it, uh so this vehicle went to auction winston churchill's land mm-hmm. rover they went to auction and uh, it sold for at the time uh, uh, an incredible amount of money i think some land rovers have maybe surpassed it since but yep. uh something on the order of two hundred thousand dollars you know yep. one hundred twenty thousand like pounds um yep. So uh, definitely a special and remarkable vehicle appreciated by enthusiasts. It went to a Swiss automobile museum. I can't remember mm. exactly what the name of that one was, but unfortunately they decided that they would paint it uh, over the original paint. So, oh. but they didn't paint it like the original color. They didn't like restore it to factory new condition. They sort of did like a, a dulled finish, paint job on this incredibly historic vehicle. You can uh, look up photos of it, how it sits right now. It is incredibly sad that that vehicle succumbed to that fate, but at least it still exists and it's still on display. I think next to a wax figurine of Winston Churchill and his dog. Well, it's nice. It's a compliment, uh, I believe to the wax figurine of Winston Churchill. I I own here uh, that just watches me sleep. Which I, is a very comforting. Uh, the very weird comforting. part of that is you told me that it was anatomically correct. It is 100%. From, <laughs> from stem to stern, as they will. From back to front, as the British say. Uh, and on that note, uh, Ike, it has been uh, a wonderful uh, podcast. And uh, more than anything, uh, again, guests. The world is expanding at uh, at an alarming rate. Um, I, uh, I did a little bit. I was doing some work on the... Uh, on the stage one this weekend and uh, cleaning uh, upholstery, uh, vacuuming upholstery, uh, extracting seats and things, and uh, did a little post. Put you it up on the you old. You can't wash out shame. It's no, impossible. you can't. It's true. Uh, but you should see the color, like chocolate milk that came wow. out of those seats, like and not like a like a like a healthy chocolate, like Starbucks chocolate milk, like Whoa. the pure, yeah, real not not good. It actually, I had to clean my sink. I backed up the sink a little bit. I'm going to dump it outside <laughs> in the future. So, anyways, um, that uh, that being said, uh, let us know if you like the weird weekend Instagram stories, um, or if you don't want us to ever do that again. Um, I uh, I don't blame you. I I you know we're giving it a go we're trying to give the people the things that we want the things that they want rather but uh clearly we don't know uh, what that is so at any rate um if you are for any reason looking for a new uh podcast to, to sponsor on the old uh patreon why not uh you know look us up uh luke our very good friend from australia has uh, pinged us saying that uh, he was thrilled to hear us talking about a bush tucker man who is uh one of ike and i's absolute favorite and has actually given us a new a new and yet more esoteric uh, Australian uh, outback 
uh, celebrity Land Rover owner that has a show that we're going to have to check out on YouTube. Ooh, so I so can't more wait about that coming up. Um, we are uh, in the midst of our Instagram uh, contest uh, that uh, went up on uh, Tuesday of last week as we're <laughs> recording this in the past and that's in the future. So Tuesday of sometime in the in the distant past. But, you know, because you've already tagged all of your friends uh, on the Instagram and ask them to uh, to come and listen to the show. Um, and uh, we will be sending out a t shirt to the winner on the next episode. So uh, look forward to that. And as always, hey, if you feel like rating the show um, and telling us all how much you enjoy Ike stories about Winston Churchill wax figures, <laughs> go ahead and throw that up on Apple Podcasts. So uh, that's it for this week, Ike. It's been a pleasure. I'm glad we didn't kill Frank and uh, more to come. All right. I'm looking forward to it.